Hi, today I'm looking at assessing a patient with a new onset third cranial nerve palsy, also called an oculomotor nerve palsy. So what are the clinical features? Well, the oculomotor nerve supplies the levator palpebrae superioris muscle, responsible for elevating the upper eyelid. It also supplies four of the six extraocular muscles, superior rectus, medial rectus, inferior oblique and inferior rectus. It has no sensory action. Loss of the function of the third nerve therefore causes the remaining lateral rectus and superior oblique muscles to act unopposed and deviate the eye down and out. It also carries parasympathetic innervation to the pupil responsible for pupil constriction. A palsy may therefore leave the pupil dilated. This pupil involvement is typically spared in microvascular palsy. Finally, the deviated eye is hidden behind the drooping or totic eyelid due to loss of levator function. This ptosis may relieve the unpleasant diplopia caused by the deviation of the affected eye. Let's look at the pathway of the oculomotor nerve. If we look at the brainstem from the side through the temporal lobe, the oculomotor nerve nucleus lies at the level of the superior colliculus in the midbrain. The nerve exits ventrally as a subarachnoid portion, then into the cavernous sinus, where it splits into superior and inferior branches before entering the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. In section, the oculomotor nerve nuclei lie centrally, close to the midline. The superior rectus subnucleus is distinct in supplying the contralateral eye, while there is a single midline subnucleus supplying both levator muscles. Dorsal midbrain infarction may therefore cause an ipsilateral third nerve palsy, with, in addition, a contralateral upgaze palsy and partial ptosis. The infarct may be visible on MRI. Pretectal nuclei lie dorsally and receive innervation from the optic tract as part of the pupil light reflex. These then pass fibres bilaterally to the edding of vesphile nucleus, which is the parasympathetic nucleus responsible for pupil constriction and closely related to the oculomotor nucleus. Fibres from both pass ventrally through the red nucleus and cerebral peduncles and exit as a fascicular subarachnoid oculomotor nerve. Lesions affecting the red nucleus or cerebral peduncles cause ipsilateral flapping tremor or contralateral hemiplegia respectively. Both are easily detected by asking the patient to stretch out their arms. The parasympathetic fibres run superficially within the nerve and as mentioned are typically spared by microvascular ischemia, which is a common cause of oculomotor nerve palsy in diabetics. Pain in and around the eye is quite common but neck stiffness or decreased consciousness are not features. The palsy evolves over a period of around three days, shows improvement within four weeks and has completely resolved within four months. A painless third nerve palsy with pupil sparing should make the possibility of ocular myasthenia a consideration where the patient is not diabetic. Check blood pressure, fasting glucose, ESR and CT head in patients under 50. Re-examine the patient in one to three days if the symptoms are less than 48 hours duration to check the pupils remain normal. The circle of Willis lies immediately beside the subarachnoid oculomotor nerve with supply from the single basilar artery and two internal carotid arteries. The major branches of these are the anterior cerebral, middle cerebral and posterior cerebral arteries. These are connected into a circle by the single anterior communicating artery, which is the most common site of berry aneurysm, and the two posterior communicating arteries. Posterior communicating artery aneurysms occur at the origin of the artery from the internal carotid and compress the adjacent oculomotor nerve, especially upon rupture with subarachnoid hemorrhage. The patient presents with severe headache, reduced consciousness, neck stiffness and vomiting. The associated oculomotor nerve palsy is isolated, may take three days to maximise but normally becomes complete and pupil dilation is the rule. Formal angiography is indicated to exclude aneurysm in all isolated oculomotor nerve palsies with a dilated pupil, with MR angiography an option where the index of suspicion is lower, for example an otherwise well diabetic patient with an oculomotor nerve palsy and slight pupil dilation. The subarachnoid portion of the third nerve is also vulnerable to basal meningeal infection, inflammation or neoplastic infiltration, and these usually affect multiple cranial nerves. Next, the oculomotor nerve enters the cavernous venous sinus. This dural venous sinus lies beneath the frontal lobes of the brain with the temporal lobes laterally. The sphenoid sinus lies inferiorly and the pituitary gland sits in the middle within the cella tersica. The optic chiasm crosses in front of the pituitary stalk and the internal carotid arteries loop through the sinus. Laterally, the oculomotor nerve sits against the lateral wall 
as do the fourth nerve and the upper two branches of the trigeminal nerve. The obtusance nerve is more medial and is most often the first nerve to be affected by cavernous sinus pathology. Lesions here tend to affect multiple cranial nerves, although a fourth or sixth nerve deficit can be difficult to demonstrate clinically when combined with a third nerve palsy. Therefore, particular attention should be paid to features suggestive of trigeminal nerve involvement. This would be burning pain and numbness affecting the forehead or cheek, representing the first or second division of the trigeminal nerve. Pupil involvement here is variable with both sympathetic and parasympathetic pupillary fibres present. The pupil may therefore be large, small or normal. Causes of cavernous sinus lesions include tolosa hunt granulomatous inflammation, pituitary, nasopharyngeal or metastatic neoplasms and intercavernous aneurysms. Herpes zoster may also affect the oculomotor nerve associated with ophthalmic shingles. Finally, the third nerve enters the orbit as superior and inferior branches through the superior orbital fissure and may be damaged by orbital fractures. The superior branch supplies levator and superior rectus, the inferior supplying medial rectus, inferior oblique, inferior rectus, pupil and ciliary muscle. A partial third nerve palsy affecting one of these branches may be a feature of oculomotor palsy elsewhere along its path and doesn't necessarily localise pathology to the cavernous sinus or orbit. Pathology within the orbit usually features an abduction deficit as well as proptosis, lid swelling, conjunctival injection and chemosis. Assessment and follow-up of oculomotor nerve palsy is usually by an ophthalmologist in conjunction with orthoptists, who as well as measuring the degree of deficit may prescribe prisms to control diplopia during recovery. A few key points once more. The oculomotor palsy is characterised by unilateral ptosis and an eye that is down and out. Pupil dilation suggests compression, possibly by berry aneurysm. A contralateral ptosis or upgaze palsy suggests a dorsal midbrain lesion. An ipsilateral ataxia or contralateral hemiparesis suggests rostral midbrain lesion, which should be checked by asking the patient to stretch out their arms. Check for facial paresthesia, corneal sensation, and ask about burning facial pain or numbness to consider cavernous sinus lesions. To criticise, comment, or share your knowledge with others, please go to ivideos.blogspot.com, where you will find transcripts, links, and more videos.